Hello everyone, my name is Jace Johnson. Uh, welcome to week two of the Tanyuk Survival Guide COVID-19 edition. This is a five week program where each week we facilitate a session focused on COVID-19 topics that are relevant to the campus community. This program is hosted by Tamuk Public Health students enrolled in the Program Implementation and Evaluation class taught by Dr. Elizabeth Wachira in the Health and Human Performance Department. Last week, we talked about what COVID-19 is, who is at risk, and ways to overcome some of the challenges we are facing living in this new norm. Today, our guest speakers will help guide this conversation focused on COVID-19 prevention and what we can all do to keep our campus and our loved ones safe. Uh, now I'll introduce our week two members. We have myself, Jace Johnson, William Prevost, Matthew Hargis, Leslie Campuzano, Isabella Ward, and Asia Willard. Uh, I'll now let Asia introduce our guest speakers. Thank you, Jace. I am Asia Willard, by the way, and I will be introducing our panelists for the evening. So I have Miss Amina Reebok and Miss Jasmine Urazi, and I'll just start with Miss uh, Amina's background. So she's a nurse practitioner at Student Health Services. She graduated with her bachelor's and her master's from Maryville University. And she also has a background in primary care, acute care surgery trauma. And so for Ms. Jasmine, she's a health service researcher at American Institutes of Research. She also received her master's at the uh, University of Texas and bachelor's of science in human development and family sciences from the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, she also has expertise in conducting research with Spanish speaking populations and coordinating research partnerships with community-based organizations. Thank you, Asia. Uh, to, kick thing, to kick things off, Will, will you start a talk session with introducing our icebreaker? Yes, thank you, Jace. So for this session, guys, our icebreaker is gonna be the question of, um, share an experience you've had with forgetting a mask. For those that are in the session, go ahead and type your answer in the chat. And I will go ahead and turn over to Miss Amina and Miss Jasmine if you guys want to go ahead and share an experience uh, you've had with forgetting a mask. We'll start with you, Miss Amina. Um, it's not something that obviously we're in the habit of. Um, so, you know, whether it's going to a store or, um, you know, going into out of my office and into a patient room and halfway through, I'm like, oh, got to grab the mask. Uh, so something just we have to get into the habit of doing. But certainly we're all human and we're going to forget stuff. Mm -hmm. For sure. And then what about you, Ms. Jasmine? Similar experience. Um, I, earlier this week, I was taking my little one to um, a, a vaccine appointment. And, you know, you would, th it's in a hospital system, her, her pediatrician's office, and you would think that that would be the place where I wouldn't forget it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I did, but, you know, it was in the car, and so no big deal, went back in. But, um, you know, it's funny how, you know, we hadn't been in the last six months because your prior appointment was at 12 months um and yeah out of all places that's where i forgot it <laughs> very good and what about you asia um i would say i forget my mask just about everywhere i go which is pretty bad but i always have to just run back to my car and go get it um so like the store even if you, i just go eat somewhere or just go to grab food i literally always forget it and i have to run back to the car and go get it but like you say we're all human so it, it happens uh for myself it's kind of the same situation except for me a lot of the times coming off of class at 10 in the morning going to work at 11 i'll just walk out of my house forget my mask in my car right there on my table as i'm walking out of the room but uh about halfway come back and grab it so you know like y'all said we are all human uh what about you jace uh like everyone else i usually keep two or three masks in my car but there's always those times where you think you're alone and so you're going out to do something real quick and then someone just happens upon you and i feel like i catch myself holding my breath and trying to speak as little as possible and stay away and then grab my mask as fast as i can uh what about you izzy 
um, <clears throat> sometimes when I'm just doing like basic things, like during the day, I just forget it and I have to like run home and grab it. But usually I keep like four or five masks like in like my purse or in my, my car. Leslie, do you have an experience with forgetting your mask anywhere? Yeah, mostly, like you guys said, like a quick stops. I, I just like, I'm just thinking about running in the gas station or something, just like coming out super fast. I'm like, oh crap, like I need to grab my mask. And yeah, just like everybody else, I keep so like five masks in my car and just grab one every time. Like, I don't know how many masks I've thrown away and <laughs> lost. I don't know. Yeah. Matt, what about you? Um, so, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago when it was raining a lot, um, I had to go to the wreck for work. Um, and so I pull up to the wreck um, and get out of my car and sprint to the doors so I don't get rained on as much. And as soon as I get to the door, I see the sign that says, hey, you need a mask. So I have to sprint all the way back to my car and then all the way back with the mask and ended up getting drenched and it was not a fun time. Yeah, that's rough, but I'm sure we're all going to have at least one of those experiences soon. Uh, everyone that's participating after our discussion panel, we will have a Q&A session. So if you start thinking of questions you want to ask our guest speakers, go ahead and put it in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll get to it whenever it's time. Uh, let's jump into things uh, with Miss Jasmine. Uh, it's kind of new, this novel coronavirus, and everyone's trying to get accustomed to it and learn more about it. That's kind of why we're hosting this program. Can you tell us uh, how does social distancing and wearing a mask work in preventing COVID-19? Yeah, um, so I'll start by saying that I'm, you know, not an epidemiologist, um, but, you know, what I do know is from following the research that we have gathered, you know, in the last six, seven months on this, um, you know, and I think that we know from contract contact tracing efforts, um, just how important and critical social distancing is, right? Um, because, you know, I think what's so unique about this virus is the window uh, before symptoms or the asymptomatic nature in some individuals. Um, and this thought, this idea that you can be spreading it unknowingly, and then also the range of severity of symptoms in, uh, in different populations, right? And we know that we're seeing early evidence of some populations being more vulnerable than others to the virus. Um, so with that said, you know, I think that um, it, it's critical to social distance uh, in the sense that if you do happen to be one of those asymptomatic individuals or you are in that window, which as far as we know right now is 14 days, you know, that, that's the number we've been given um, and, and that seems to be the case. Um, you know, it, it's important because um, if, if you have been exposed and you don't know about it, um, everything from, you know, I, I just moved, for example, and had lots of um, repair people coming in and out and that mask, you know, that's another instance where forgetting it, um, uh, it would really be detrimental, right? Because it's like if there was exposure with signing a package, uh, you know, a few days back uh, and I'm asymptomatic or I'm, you know, within that 14 day window and I just had over 10 repair people come in and install things or the movers come in and out, um, well then that makes, you know, then I'm exposing them and so on and so forth. And if they live in multi-generational families with individuals that are more vulnerable, well then that's a whole nother, uh, you know, that, that, that's a whole nother set of individuals, you know. Um, and what comes to mind, I don't know if you guys followed that story of the wedding in Maine, uh, where I think now the death toll is up to 10 individuals that did not attend the wedding have died. Uh, and this was all uncovered through contact tracing efforts. Um, and so, you know, when you think of the impact, right, that the actions at the individual level can have, um, you know, I, I think that when we think about it in terms of that, 
you know, it's, it's uh, easier to understand this concept of, of why it's so important to social distance and make sacrifices for the population at large. I totally agree. Uh, to Vicky. Sure, and just to add, you know, to that, um, you know, we know that masks don't work 100% of time, you know, if you want us to tell you here that, you know, this is the percentage, we know 100% it's going to work, you know, we don't have that data, we probably never will just because we can't do a controlled randomized trial, it would be unethical to give, you know, John a mask and, you know, Bob not a mask and then say here, you know, here's COVID. So we're never going to have the perfect data that's going to be straightforward from what the research that they've done thus far, um, you know, it says that it does help. So IHME put out um, some, uh, some data just a couple of months back that if 95% of people wear a mask, you can reduce COVID transmission by 30%, you know, um, and if we're trending up towards, a thousand, you know, 100,000 cases a day, if you can reduce that by 30% and you're down to 70, you know, then that's a huge impact, you know, that'll lessen the burden on our healthcare system that's, you know, already strained. Um, so again, the data is not going to be perfect, but we know masks work in addition to hand hygiene and physical distancing. Um, all those things combined together, we can make a good impact. So, Ms. Amina, um, are some masks more effective or what's the best mask to use if you can't get your hands on an N95? Sure. Um, so the, the best data that's out there that I've seen so far has been a study out of Duke that they um, just put out back in August. Um, they did, I think, a total of 14 masks, everything from a N95 all the way down to a Gator mask. Um, uh, your best masks are going to be your N95, then a surgical mask, but right there behind them is going to be your cotton mask. Um, obviously, the more layers, two to three layers, is going to be better than a single layer. Um, the, the gators, the bandanas, those have um, proved to be not effective at all, essentially. Um, the rule of thumb for me is, you know, if you put it up to the light and you can see through it, it's probably not a good mask. So a multi-layer cotton mask is going to be your best bet um, and it's going to provide the most protection. Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Jasmine, for people hearing that and thinking that even with that data, they think that masks aren't effective. What would you say to them, to the people that think that masks harm them instead of help them? So it's an interesting question because, um, you know, when I saw the question, you know, when I, I received the email, you know, I immediately thought of my experience doing community-based participatory research when we go into communities and get their buy-in. I just think that community buy-in is so important um, and so whether it's engaging leaders, you know, whether it's, you know, a faith leader, right, like a pastor, like who has a voice in that community? Um, sometimes messaging works better versus experts, right, because the, the public or, you know, that those particular communities trust those leaders. Um, so again, based on, on my experience conducting community participatory research, that's kind of where I gravitate towards uh, as far as, um, you know, trying to persuade individuals one way or another. I don't know if Amina has a, a better response here, you know, uh, from the provider perspective. Sure, so masks, we know that there's no data out there that says masks hurt us. If you're over two years of age, if you don't have um, you know, certain health restrictions that prevent you from it, it's not going to hurt you. Um, you know, masks are there to, as a source control, right? So if potentially, you know, I, potentially I have COVID, if I wear the mask, I'm going to reduce how much particles I'm, I'm putting out into the air by talking or sneezing or coughing, or if I'm asymptomatic. Um, so it's, you know, we know that, that they're not going to harm you. Um, the data that's out there says that they are helpful. How helpful? Yet to be determined. Um, but, you know, it's such a new virus. It's evolving. You know, now we're talking about, hey, it's airborne, which, you know, changes things um, quite a bit as well. So, um, you know, I strongly, you know, push wear your mask and along with the hand hygiene and the physical distancing, you know, until we have more valid data, um, which I think it's going to trend into, it does help. Um, studies from 
pass from other viruses and bacteria, um, you know, wearing a surgical mask or a three layer cotton mask, um, you know, has significantly reduced the, the amount of particle that gets expelled into the air um, by using masks as a source, source control. So uh, we have that data to, you know, stand by and, and for us to keep recommending it. So to piggy off the last question about how some people think wearing masks could be harmful, uh, I think some people may think that because I've heard of um, improper mask use and when people put it down on their necks and like you're not supposed to do that. Can you tell us ways um, what's effective in terms of putting on a mask, removing it, and how to store it? Sure. Um, so when it's down here, it's a chin guard, so it, it does nothing for anybody, right? Um, same with, you know, putting it on the side or upwards or carrying it, you know, uh, on your wrist. Um, so the best, the best thing to do is, um, and I've got some supplies here, so when you're, when you're putting your mask on is to um, either wash your hands or use some hand sanitizer. I personally carry this around and I just clip it on um, so it's always handy. Um, so you always want to practice hand hygiene, so um, hand sanitizer, wash your hands. Um, Another thing that I always carry is either a plastic bag or a paper bag. Plastic bag is going to be a little bit more convenient where you can put it in the purse or put it in your car. Um, however, I wouldn't recommend that you um, close it and leave it at pro for, for prolonged periods just because obviously it may be wet, mold may um, grow there. So the best thing is going to be like an open container, right? Um, so as far as um, putting the mask on. Everybody's mask is going to be a little bit different uh, when you're putting it on for the first time. Obviously, it's a clean mask. Um, you know, you always want to start with your nose, pinch it down, um, and then your ear loops, okay? And you want to make sure it's nice and snug. Um, if it's too loose, um, if, you know, you're putting it down here, again, it's not, you're not going to get the benefit. So you, you want to make sure that it's snug. You want to make sure that it's also not too tight. Um, you know, you don't want to restrict your, your breathing. Um, when you're taking the mask off, again, you want to, after you've worn it, this is going to be your contaminated part. So anytime that you touch this, you have to consider this hand contaminated and you have to use hand sanitizer, wash your hands. So you want to try not touch the front part. And when you take it off, you take it by the ear loops and fold it. So mine's not going to be as bendable as your, your cotton one may be, but essentially fold it. And then you put it in your plastic container, a bag, um, or, or a paper bag or a plas uh, plastic Ziploc bag. Um, typically recommend washing it every single day or if it gets soiled um, as far as, you know, caring for it. Um, you know, you can put it with your regular laundry on the hottest cycle that you um, can. Um, you can also, if you don't have a washing machine, you can always um, just do five, four or five tablespoons of bleach with some just tap water um, and let it soak in there for five minutes, rinse it, and then have it um, dry, you know, in the sunlight, just make sure that it's completely dry. Um, again, any time that you fiddle with your mask, so, you know, you're always, if you're adjusting it, then it's probably an ill-fitting mask, and you should probably get a, a little bit better fitting mask, but any time that you adjust this part, your hand is contaminated, you have to clean your hand every time that you touch it, okay? Thank you so much. That was really helpful, because I keep hand sanitizer in my car, but now I feel like mm -hmm. I need to carry it everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, it, um, the, the little latches are pretty helpful that way, you know, it's always there. This is something that I um, have and I refill, um, just make sure it's clean and I refill it with the hand sanitizer um, that I have or the, the ones that attach to um, purses or belt loops, but it's good to have it on hand. Um, I know a lot of places have done a really great job um, with sanitizing stations, so, you know, that's always um, an option too, but um, again, try and keep your mask on, try not to fiddle with it, um, taking it off by the ear loops and folding it, storing it in a, in a clean place. You know, don't put it in your car dashboard, don't put it in your pocket. Um, it's got to be stored in a clean place. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jasmine, what else can people do to help prevent the spread of COVID-19? I'm going to go back to social distancing um, because I think that, you know, as far as um, the public has, you know, 
consumed this information. Um, you know, I still think that when we say social distancing, individuals have different definitions of that. A lot of people think that that does, you know, for some reason, going to your parents' house is exempt from that, right? Like, like that's okay. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, like, we keep seeing stories in the news um, and, you know, in journal articles now, you know, through uh, contact tracing efforts again, that um, this is spreading through households, you know, this is spreading through uh, multi-generational households, um, through small gatherings, um, and so this idea of your bubble and keeping your bubble small, uh, but again, you know, I think that there, there, there needs to be an effort to really define um, what social distancing means. Um, and, you know, I know I, I recently saw that the UK, for instance, banned uh, travel between households. I know Michigan did at some point. Um, there's a lot of resistance to that, but that's a whole other topic. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that, that that's critical because, you know, we can shut down businesses, we can do that, but if individuals are traveling from household to household um, and, you know, they, they may or may not necessarily be wearing masks, but as we get into the winter, you know, individuals will be indoors with the heater um, and, and we do have data on that, of, you know, particle virus transmission, you know, indoors versus outdoors. Um, you know, that's also something to consider, you know, and it's something that comes to mind as we get into the holiday season. Um, and then, you know, folks have COVID fatigue right now. You know, we're hearing a lot about COVID fatigue. Um, and so I, I just think that it's important to keep this concept of social distancing in mind and, and how that applies in terms of holidays, family gatherings, your bubble, how much you want to open up that bubble, um, and, and how that definition varies. That's so true. That's really hard to think about, to think that your family uh, is infected or that you may be infected to others. You feel like your whole family is just free and you should be able to see them. But I think that's true, especially with the coming holidays. I think it's going to be a lot harder to get accustomed to this new norm and actually social distance from who you need to. Uh, Miss Amina, what is one thing you would like to see more on our campus that would be helpful in preventing new COVID cases? Um, sure, you know, I think the school has done a great job with contact tracing, um, you know, that's done at the Health of Science Center down at um, Big A&M. Um, the EOC has done a fantastic job with um, identifying those who need to be quarantined with the RLL, you know, finding places for, for those who need to be isolated quarantined. Um, so I think the university has done a really, really um, great job as far as you know, communicating and um, placing who needs to be placed, and you know, making those accommodations. Um, you know, we have plenty of testing. We do drive-through testing. Um, honestly, you know, I think we could all do a better job at um, the physical distancing and um, uh, you wearing our masks. You know, I think we just get a little bit too comfortable with one another. Oh well, you're you're in my bubble, so we're fine. You know, but it's still, and I'm guilty of that as well, it's still important that even though, you know, we may consider someone in our bubble that we, you know, maintain distance as much as we can. Um, masks do not replace physical distancing. So even if you're close and you're wearing masks, you're still considered a close um, contact. And CDC just came out um, today with new guidance as far as, you know, the, the 15 minutes. So um, it's cumulative over a 24-hour period. So if you were with someone for a minute here, a minute there, and in that day, it turns out over 15 minutes, then you're considered a close contact as well. So that's something that's um, new. So if, you know, uh, our thinking is, well, it was just a few minutes, you know, that, that can add up, especially if you see that person over and over again. So um, I would say the, the physical distancing and, you know, really assuming that everybody has it, right? Because it's, it's so prevalent. We know the cases are on the rise and just taking those precautions. Thank you. I know we have uh, questions from the audience for you two. Um, I'm gonna invite Will to start the Q&A session so we can get some of that rolling. Yes, thank you, Jace. So uh, we pick out a few questions from the audience here for you, Miss Amina and you, Miss Jasmine. Uh, the first question I wanna go ahead and start us off with here is the question of 
with the variety of masks that we see people using from face shields, bandanas, the little neck coverings and the regular masks, um, do you guys think there needs to be more education and awareness of what masks are readily and uh, best available in terms of we should be using only the blue masks or, you know, uh, what needs to be, is, does there need to be more awareness in terms of what masks are effective? Uh, sure. So, yeah, definitely. You know, the more the evidence that we're getting is that um, overwhelmingly the bandanas, the, the gators are not effective. Um, so it, it, it needs to be more education as far as, well, let's, let's use the cotton masks. Let's do the multi-layer masks. And that's really all we need are the multi-layer masks. So, um, you, know, you know, I'm no scientist and obviously I haven't done any um, studies. It's just what I've looked at. at. But if you do have a gator that has multiple layers, then you're going to have more benefit than, than the single layer ones that I've seen some on campus. Uh, but again, it's going to be the cotton masks, um, the, the multi-layer two to three layers that are going to provide the most protection, almost as good as a surgical mask. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Ms. Jasmine? What are your thoughts? I absolutely agree, you know, and um, you know, I, I think it'd be great to have more education about it out there. I think this is kind of where our efforts intersect with health policy, um, because I, I do know that the, the order that we have, I, I think the general term that they use is a face covering. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I have seen businesses uh, here in Collin County, at least, that have signs that say, you know, you must wear a mask, no bandanas. I don't know if you guys have seen some of those. Um, so, you know, again, um, this is where I think um, the data that we know would translate to health policy. Um, and that's sort of separate from the, uh, the public education. Um, but I mean, I think, I think educating the public about this um, and, and how protection varies according to mask type is, is for sure important. Awesome, thank you. So we'll get to the next question. Um, if we are unable to physically distance from people for whatever reason, what would you guys say is the most efficient way to clean yourself, your clothes, mask, or whatever you touch? Uh, and we'll start with you this time, Ms. Jasmine. Um, if you are unable to physically distance uh, in the sense that you have to be indoors with someone? Yes, ma'am. Oh, goodness. Um, and what was the second part of the question? How to clean? What would be like the best way to clean, uh, keep your mask, your, your clothes, stuff like that clean, uh, yourself clean, you know, besides just the traditional, if there's anything in addition. In terms of COVID transmission, I, I don't know if there's a correct answer to that or, or if we do know that yet, uh, especially like if you, if for whatever reason, you have to be confined in a space where you cannot physically distance six feet. Um, and I mean, you could wear your mask, but you know, like we said earlier in the session, they, that won't protect you 100%. Um, and then there's a question of, well, what type of mask is the other individual wearing? What type of mask you're wearing? There's so many variables um, to consider. Um, ventilation, for instance. Um, so I, I, I don't know um, what the best way to, you know, clean yourself afterwards and, and if cleaning would even do anything at that point. So to elaborate on that, um, we know that indirect contact is not a huge driver. The main driver is going to be the, the physical distance. So as far as, you know, cleaning your mask and clothes, um, I, it's no different. Put it all in the laundry, the hottest cycle that's possible, and then dry it. So um, you don't need to put things, you know, in a bag and throw it in the trash. You wouldn't do it any differently than you would your other clothes. Um, I would say if you were in a high risk situation, if you were in a large gathering, um, you know, where people weren't, socially distance, come home, kind of strip off in your garage or, you know, by your door, and then just wash everything, go take a shower, you know, wash your hands. You really got to also make sure you're not touching your eyes and your mouth. You know, that's, that's how, um, you know, the virus can get into your body, essentially, if you did touch things, um, door handles, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I don't think that there's any other special precautions um, that you need to do as far as clothes go. Awesome. Thank you, guys. The next question 
Um, other than masks, what are some other PPE y'all would consider kind of COVID essential to help uh, students and just people living their lives to kind of make it through the pandemic? And uh, Ms. Samina, we can actually start with you on this one. Sure. Um, so that that's really it. It's going to be the masks and physical distancing and hand hygiene. I would not recommend doing gloves. Um, I, you're just going to end up contaminating, you know, yourself, um, you know, by doing gloves. Um, you know, same with, you. I suppose you can do a face shield. I don't know. I have not seen very much data on face shields, um, but, you know, it's, it's certainly not going to hurt. Um, you know, again, it's uh, depending on what kind of face shield you have, um, you know, if you, if you are sneezing or coughing, it's, it's certainly going to help as far as you know, it's not going to propel it forward where it's going outward, it's going to drop down. So, um, but, you know, aside from the mask, I probably wouldn't recommend much more. I would reserve the surgical masks, the N95 masks for the healthcare providers as we go into, as we are in the flu season. Um, you know, with cases rising, I know that uh, that uh, there's going to be a shortage. So um, again, we want to reserve those for for the healthcare workers who are working the front lines with the COVID patients. For sure. And Ms. Jasmine, do you have anything to add to that one? Uh, no, I think Amina covered it. Uh, I think yeah, that works. Okay, perfect. And then one other question for you guys here: um, What if someone around you, say in your your household or your bubble, as y'all were talking about, just flat out refuses to wear a mask? Uh, or has a, you know, is one of the people that will wear them temporarily, but then take them off as soon as they get to wear it. What would you guys say uh, to help inform them that it's, uh, it's needed? Uh, Ms. Jasmine, if you want to start us off. Um, I, you know, I think that if, if this were the case, if, for instance, in my home, um, I'd start by educating on the numbers, right? Um, and, you know, I don't know in this particular scenario, um, if the individual would happen to be someone that's younger, that, you know, thinks maybe, you know, that they, they, perhaps they're thinking this way because they think that they're not likely to be as affected by the virus. Um, you know, I, I use the data about, you know, how hospitalizations are rising in younger folks, right? That's something that we're seeing. Um, and, um, you know, this idea of the long haulers, so they're calling it like long COVID, um, you know, people that just can't seem to kick it or have migraines or, you know, other um, symptoms, you know, as eight weeks or longer, you know, after the the first sign of infection. Um, so I, I probably present information about that, about how, you know, this doesn't start and end just with, you know, um, the onset of COVID. And, it, it, you know, in, in many cases, it's not something that just goes away two weeks later and then you test negative. You know, we're, we're hearing about folks with kidney disease and, and other complications. Um, so I present the information about the complications. Awesome. And with that, we will go ahead and conclude our Q&A. Jace, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Will. Uh, the goal of this session is, to, uh, and the entire program, is to facilitate COVID conversations and answer questions the TAMU campus may have and help us keep our campus COVID-free. Uh, what are the, if you could boil this down to one takeaway that you want TAMU students to take away from this session, what would it be? And I'll start with you, Amina. Sure. Um, there was a question on there about surgical masks and um, which side. Typically, it's the, the top side that's usually on the outside, which is usually um, the blue. Um, again, it just all depends on how it was open. I don't think it really matters, but if you're touching the top part, that's going to be your contaminated one. So once you put it on, um, it's typically the blue. Um, again, as far as um, masks go, we know that they do help. How much do they help? We don't know yet, but you know, they, they are there. They're gonna, it's us protecting. If I'm wearing a mask, I'm protecting a, another person that I'm around. Um, but if we both wear masks and of course we're all protecting each other, um, you know, the physical distancing, we're all gonna get through this, you know, one, one day we'll get through it. We just have to get through these hard times over the next couple of months and um, you know, we'll get there. We'll be able to have uh, many more Christmases and Thanksgivings with our family, but um, I think we should all really consider, um, you know, especially our young college students that are here now is, you know, do we have a grandma or grandfather or, you know, an uncle that does have underlying health issues and that are 
high risk of having severe disease and high risk of death is, you know, do I, do I stay, stay away from that? And we not have a big, you know, family get together because um, God willing in the future we are, we're all going to be able to get together and, you know, for birthdays, but, you know, for right now, for the good of, of all of us um, really try and, and um, not, not be in those high risk, you know, situations where, you know, you're spreading it down. And um, like Jasmine said, it just goes one person to another, to another. And, and, you know, then you've got unfortunately 10 um, individuals who have passed, you know, because of one, one party, one wedding. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jasmine, what is the one thing you want TAMU students to take away from this program? Um, as we head into the holiday season, you know, I, I think this physical distancing and, and your bubble, right? Um, like, who's in your bubble? Uh, do they have, you know, children that are attending in-person school, you know, and how is that going to affect the Thanksgiving gathering that you have planned? So again, just the importance of physical distancing, uh, applying what we do know that works. So we've been talking about masks. So we know they work. We don't know to what extent, but we know that, you know, it's certainly enough um, to reduce transmission. Um, so if everyone, you know, just does their part um, and, you know, in some cases we may have to make sacrifices. Um, and, and, you know, it's important to be as transparent as possible with with whoever is in your bubble, if you do decide to have a gathering, because, you know, I think we've all had that awkward moment when we decide to see someone and, you know, we say, oh, okay, we're going to be safe for 14 days before. And then they casually mention, oh, well, I was picking so-and-so up from daycare or school. And you're like, whoa, I didn't know that. Um, so I think, you know, being as transparent as possible with all the individuals in your bubble um, and making sure that they're, you know, that you're adhering to their level of comfort and vice versa and, 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 you know, implementing and applying what we do know that works and that's, you know, mask usage, hand hygiene, um, you know, and a lot of the other things that Amina talked about. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. That's going to conclude our discussion panel. Um, this was a great session. We talked about how to properly wear a mask, how to store it. Um, we need a focus on how we social distance and like think about who's in your circle and we need to focus on doing things the right way and adapting to this new norm. Uh, I want to thank our guest speakers for taking the time to talk and share with us their knowledge. Um, I want to thank our viewers. Uh, let us know what you thought and help us spread the word. Uh, thank you week two group members uh, for all the hard work you put in to make this possible. Uh, and thank you to everyone that tuned in. Uh, this was the second week of the virtual COVID awareness program. Uh, help us keep this conversation going and our campus informed and be sure to connect with us on social media and we'll be posting uh, takeaways from this session uh, next week and be sure to tune in next week as our campus rec and counseling center join in to share what we can do to keep our emotional and physical health high in this new norm. Thank you, everyone.